Once again, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm very excited because we have History Month, Discover History Month for the Libraries October, so that's just around the corner, but I managed to sneak in a history program in September because I love history so much. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, I did live in the Philadelphia area for a little while, so I'm especially excited about this program because it's going to address some um, connections between a family that's very well known here in the Camden area and I knew very well in the Philadelphia area. So if you are from Camden, you may have heard of Curtis Island Lighthouse, Curtis Island. You may have, have seen roads named after the Curtis family. You may know that Mary Louise Curtis Bach um, donated the land that the Camden Public Library sits upon uh, and commissioned our beautiful Camden Amphitheater. So there's numerous, numerous ties in the Camden and Midcoast Maine area to the Curtis family. And I'm thrilled that our presenter this evening is going to tell us a little bit more about the family and what they had going on in Philadelphia, and especially the beautiful Curtis Arboretum. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's presenter. Thomas Wachowski is Vice President of the Old York Road Historical Society and Vice Chair of the Cheltenham Township Historical Commission. He received his Bachelor of Science from Villanova University and PhD from the Catholic University of America, Washington, DC. He is retired from Drexel University in Philadelphia, where he was the Associate Dean of the College of Business. He currently devotes his time to his lifelong hobby, historical research and writing, and is author of several books on Philadelphia history. His forthcoming book, Hitherto Invincible, is the story of three generations of the Barker family, influential 19th century Philadelphia bankers. So we may have to have him back to talk about them as well. Um, so with all of that, Welcome, Tom. Please, you may begin your presentation now. Thank you, Julia. Hello, everybody. I, I know there's many more people out there than I can see. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I, I'm really um, looking forward to the, telling you the story of Cyrus Curtis in Chelton Hills here in Pennsylvania. Uh, I live in a little town named Wincote, which is in the far northwest area outside of the city. And it is what the area is called now, uh, where Cyrus Curtis had his wonderful, his beautiful 250-acre uh, estate. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, and then uh, tell you the history of that, uh, that wonderful piece of ground. I uh, started uh, thinking about um, uh, presenting to you about a year ago. I was doing some research for a presentation on the history of Curtis for a new group that we formed here in Cheltenham Township called the Friends of Curtis Arboretum. And it was a very active group and, and, and I was doing research and uh, happened to find my way to the Camden Public Library and to the Friends of the Cotsmer Organ. And uh, they responded very generously to my request for research and uh, it uh, really increased my knowledge of the Curtis family. And, and I had no idea of how extensive their, their impact was on your area up there in Camden. Uh, they, um, uh, the, the main um, uh, connection with Camden, I think, is uh, Cyrus Curtis's estate, his summer estate, where he spent at least the month of August for a good 30 years up there in, um, in Camden, Maine. So, let me uh, push this button. Thank you. So, this is the story of Linden. It is what Cyrus Curtis named his estate here in the Shelton Hills. And uh, the background is just a detail of a, a mural that surrounds the entire music hall of his estate, the re only remaining part of his estate, unfortunately, other than the grounds. I'm gonna start off with a trivia question, just to tickle your fancy. And uh, here's the trivia question. This Curtis story figure and opera singer was the most recorded artist of the 20th century uh, recorded a musical artist. And uh, this is a fascinating little trivial sidelight to the whole Curtis story, I think. And uh, we'll get to that uh, answer as we go along with the history of the Curtis family. Cheltenham, where I live, is a, is a kind of a unique area. It really went through three uh, different ages where most of the places outside the city of Philadelphia uh, were very rural until World War II, including this area. 
And uh, for, for almost 200 years, the, the this area was known as the Cheltenham Plantation. It was a very agrarian society. And then uh, starting with the, uh, the influence of the railroads at the end of the 19th century, small towns started to develop along the railroads. And then after World War II, full-fledged suburban development took place. But this area is unique for this reason because there was a third area, a third era in between, the Gilded Age. Known as Chelton Hills, this area was the first outpost of the Gilded Age in the United States in the second half of the 19th century. And that was for two reasons. First of all, as I said, the railroad came through, in particular a railroad called the North Pennsylvania Railroad, which was intended as a freight road to bring the goods from Northeast Pennsylvania area down to Philadelphia, which were escaping Philadelphia because of the canals that fed into New York City. So this railroad was intended to uh, bring those goods, and particularly in, in addition, coal down into Philadelphia. And this is one of my favorite photographs from the Historical Society, this 1870s era locomotive at the train station just down the hill from me here in Wincote. The second factor that led to the development of this Gilded Age was this gentleman, Edward M. Davis. Uh, he was a cotton merchant in the 19th century in Philadelphia. Uh, he um, was an ardent abolitionist. He was the son-in-law of Lucretia Mott, the famous Philadelphia abolitionist. And uh, he depended upon his connections with the South to get the cotton to bring up the Philadelphia ma for manufacture and sale. And of course, his abolitionist activities did not sit well with his, uh, with his suppliers down in the South. And uh, he was eventually run out of the South. He was, had his life threatened seriously a couple times. Some of his compatriots were almost hung. Uh, just proving that abolition was not an armchair occupation in the, in the mid 19th century. So when he heard about the railroad, he persuaded uh, Thomas Farnon, the president of the North Pennsylvania Railroad, to put a station at the uh, local road, which he did, and he named it the Chelton Hill Station. And um, this provided commuter service to, to this area. Davis went about buying up all the legacy Quaker farms that he could in the general area, and he formed this organization called the Chelton Hills Land Association subdivided the lots into eight, 10, 20 uh, acre estates and started selling the, the, the rich and famous industrialists of Philadelphia. Uh, everybody laughs when they see that $750 per acre uh, up here in, in Cheltenham, uh, don't we wish. But he found that in 1854 and started selling to Philadelphians. And the selling point was not only the railroad, which got people out here in 21 minutes for 20 cents, but as the local newspaper in Philadelphia, Philadelphia Inquirer noted, the air is healthy and the purity of the water is something of which Philadelphians accustomed to that obtained from the Schuylkill can only have a faint idea. Now, when I show this slide here in Philadelphia, I get a good laugh out of it. Julia may know the joke, the Schuylkill River where Philadelphia gets its drinking water uh, for most of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century was a sewer and uh, so Davis had a good sailing point. They come out here, Philadelphia was, was unhealthy in the summertime and uh, the rich people who could afford coming out to the Shelton Hills for the healthy air and the pure water uh, did so. And it was, it was a, a, quite a successful venture. And it's okay if, uh, if you can't read all these names. And the, the point here is there are more millionaires in this square mile known as Chelton Hills uh, by the end of the 19th century than anywhere else in the United States. And uh, that, that factor uh, led to, had its Im impact on government and, and the quality of life here in the Shelton Hills. And the newspapers even noticed that uh, uh, here, here is one, uh, <laughs> one primary election where 25 millionaires were running for one position as a, as a commissioner of Cheltenham Township. So one of the first, uh, uh, residents of the Chelton Hills was this gentleman, Abraham Barker. Abraham Barker was a banker in Philadelphia. He, he was a very prominent banker, had one of the largest and most successful banks in the United States. And he bought a legacy farm uh, from uh, Aaron Cadwalder. He named it Linden and uh, moved in in 1854. He named it after his 
family estate, which they had owned since the 1600s in Rutland, England. Uh, here is some advertising for Barker. He, he was a uh, founder of the Union League in Philadelphia, a very prestigious social organization in Philadelphia. And uh, during the Civil War, uh, the Union League took it upon themselves to uh, aid President Lincoln in any way they could. And after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863, uh, Abraham Barker led the Union League in the formation of Camp William Penn, which was the first and the largest training camp for black soldiers uh, once they were allowed to be members of the Union Army uh, in uh, 1863. He weighed the equivalent of over half a million dollars. This was an amazing accomplishment. It was entirely privately funded. Uh, they raised the troops, they paid the bounties, they paid for the tents, they paid for the Springfield rifles, and, uh, and by the end of the war, raised 11 regiments of um, United States colored troops to aid in the progress of the Civil War. His son, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, joined the firm in 1868. Uh, Abraham built a house for him across the street from Linden, and uh, Wharton Barker moved in, uh, got married. Uh, he, he was also an exceptional figure in the late 19th century. And these are just a few of his accomplishments. Uh, he was the only person from our area here in the outskirts of Philadelphia who ever ran for president of the United States. But uh, he was uh, pressed into duty by his father at Camp William Fenn Penn and served as a lieutenant uh, training those troops. So their estates were across the street from each other, a road called Church Road here in the Shelton Hills, and they had a close brush with history in 1876. And if you'll remember in 1876, uh, Philadelphia was hosting the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. And one of the attractions of the Centennial was a new device by a young inventor and teacher by the name of Alexander Graham Bell. And you'll probably remember from history class way back that uh, when he exhibited his telephone at the Centennial, uh, they had an important visitor, uh, Emperor Dom uh, Pedro of, um, of Brazil, uh, who was actually chaperoned by a part-time diplomat by the name of William Auchincloss, who was also a resident of Shelton Hills. And he met uh, Bell and listened to the phone and everybody knows his famous words, my God, it talks. And he was very impressed with this whole thing. Well, Bell was looking for financing for his telephone. And we suspect through Auchincloss, he was connected up with these Chelton Hills bankers, uh, Warden Barker and his father, Abraham Barker and several other bankers from Philadelphia who lived in the area. And he was invited out the third week of July after his exhibition, that's Fateful Sunday at the Centennial, to hook up his phone between Linden and uh, Wharton Barker's home, Wincote, across the street. And they demonstrated the telephone, hoping to get the support of these bankers, and the, the experiment was very successful. And everybody was amazed that, my God, the thing talks. Well, the press found out about it. The bankers, although they were impressed, didn't think much of it. The inquirer said, this, this thing has no practical value. It's a toy. That's, that's not very valuable. Chauncey Depew of the Western Union, the idea is idiotic. Why would anybody want to do this when well, they could just send a telegram to somebody? Uh, talk about uh, breaking the paradigm. Even the President of the United States to, chimed in. Who would ever want to use one, said President Rutherford B. Hayes. So the bankers turned Bell down. He left this consulate, went back to Boston, and eventually obtained funding from his father-in-law, and we know the rest of that story. But I always felt that Chelton Hills missed their chance to become the Silicon Valley of the United States in 1876. Well, Barker met with uh, a great disappointment in uh, 1890. Uh, there was an international banking scandal that caused an international crisis. Uh, Barker was associated with uh, Barings in London, which was at the head of the uh, problem. They had made very bad investments in South America that turned sour on them as the South Americans 
cheated them out of the investments. They called on their subsidiary bankers to make up the difference, and, and Bank Barker Brothers was one of the firms to go down. Abraham Barker and Wharton Barker lost everything. They had to move out of Linden. It was put up for sale. And an up-and-coming young publisher by the name of Cyrus Herman Kochmark Curtis purchased Linden in 1892. Uh, one thing about the Curtis family, as we'll see as we go through this, that just tickles my fancy is they all have long names. <laughs> Two and three names won't do. Uh, down here, everybody's curious about why Herman Koshmar, who Herman Koshmar is, and I'll bet you you recognize the name up there. Cyrus Curtis uh, was the son of uh, Cyrus Libby Curtis. He was a paper hanger by trade, uh, was a musician, played the trombone for a group called Chandler's Band, and in his spare time toured with Chandler's Band. And while he was performing in Boston, he met this uh, immigrant from Germany, Herman Koshmar, who uh, was playing, whose band had folded in Portland, in uh, Boston. And um, Cyrus Libby persuaded him to come up to uh, Portland and find a job there. And Herman Koshmar lived with him uh, for at least a year and uh, became, became Cyrus Curtis's piano teacher. And they were such good friends that uh, Cyrus Libby and his wife Salome uh, bestowed on Cyrus, their son, the middle name of Herman Kochmar to honor their friend, Herman Kochmar, the piano teacher. Well, as soon as he could, at the age of 16, uh, Cyrus Curtis moved to Boston to uh, seek fame and fortune. He found a newspaper there um, called the People's Ledger. Uh, did not do well, and when the centennial was scheduled for Philadelphia, he decided that Philadelphia was a great place to come and make his fortune. So he moved to Philadelphia in 1876. He actually didn't really move to Philadelphia. He moved to Camden, and this, of course, was Camden, New Jersey, not your Camden, Maine. So he lived in Camden. At that time, uh, Camden was a solid middle-class neighborhood across the river from Philadelphia. Uh, it unfortunately found bad fortune in the late 19th century and early 20th century, and uh, it, it uh, was, was not a very successful place. So he, had, he was living in Camden when he started to, uh, his work in Philadelphia. Uh, he brought his newspaper with him that failed in 1879, he founded a new newspaper trying to capitalize on the extensive farmland surrounding Philadelphia and aiming to make a newspaper that would not only provide the news but uh, suit the needs of farmers on the outskirts of the city. And he hires the editor, uh, a gentleman named Thomas Meehan, whose name is well known in Philadelphia and, and has recorded the uh, title of the founder of, um, of the uh, skill of landscape architecture. He ran the paper for three years. In 1882, he was getting ready for publication, and he had a, uh, a whole page that he had to fill that he was, he, I guess he got a writer's block and couldn't fill the page. So he collected a lot of soap advertisements and, and uh, tips for women. He decided that if I could appeal to women, I can increase my, my readership of my newspaper. So he, he devised this column, which he called Women at Home and put all this stuff in there. His wife, Louisa Knapp Curtis, read it, and uh, she, uh, she didn't think much of it. <laughs> she must have been a character. She must have been a very stalwart character because she went to Cyrus and said, Cyrus, I don't mean to make fun of you, but if you really knew how funny this sounds to a woman, you would laugh too. So he said to her, and I don't know whether it was with attitude or with respect. Well, if you think you can do better, why don't you put together in the next, the next version of this column? And she said, okay, I will. And she did. And letters started coming in. Who is this Louisa Knapp? She used her, her, her maiden name, Louisa Knapp, interestingly enough, which was quite cheeky in those days. Say, who's this woman who's writing this column for you? 
Well, it was so, the demand was so great that uh, he gave up the Tribune of Farmer and launched a completely new magazine based on this column for women. And he named it the Ladies' Journal and Practical Housekeeper in 1883. Uh, an interesting little tidbit, he gave, he gave the masthead to a graphic artist to design uh, the masthead for him. And she put this nice little picture of a, of a home setting in the uh, top of the uh, journal. And underneath she wrote the uh, word home. And everybody in the world thought the name of the newspaper was the Ladies' Home Journal and Practical Housekeeper, although it wasn't. So this is what Cyrus said about his new magazine and uh, newspaper in 1883. We proposed to make it a household necessity. Uh, he was very particular uh, about uh, the uh, keeping honest, uh, having an honest journal and an honest publication. He would not accept tobacco ads. He did not accept any ads for patent medicines, which everybody knew in those days were, were phony medicines. And uh, Louisa Knapp officially became, in 1883, the editor of the Ladies' Home Journal. So good, so pure, so true, so brave, so complete that a young couple will no more think of going to housekeeping without it than without a cook stove. Well, six years she served as editor. Uh, she got tired. Um, Cyrus went out, found somebody else with a nice long name, Edward Willem Gerard Caesar Hiddebach in Boston, in uh, New York, excuse me, who was a, um, in the advertising and marketing of uh, newspapers and journals. And he was really impressed with his ability and hired him to be the new editor in 1889 of the Ladies Home Journal. Uh, he introduced a slew of innovations, changed the cover every month, eventually won a, a Pulitzer Prize. And he brought the magazine before the end of the century to be the first publication in the history of the United States with over a million subscribers. Some trivial things, he, he gave the name living room to the room which used to be called a parlor in houses. And uh, he was very much a, uh, a champion of women's suffrage and uh, reflected that in his, his writing in his magazines. It's kind of amazing that he got the job because he, he recollects in his biography and his memoirs that when he was interviewing with Cyrus Curtis, he admitted he was a bachelor and uh, apparently didn't date much, was completely driven by his business aspirations. And he told Cyrus Curtis, he said, I, I really don't know that much about women. So it's kind of, it's kind of remarkable that uh, this turned into a, a, such a wonderful publication. 1895, uh, Curtis tore down the original Linden, the, the colonial era farmhouse that uh, Abraham Barker had lived in. And he hired architect William Lloyd Bailey to build this $2 million mansion on the same site. Uh, and he kept the name Linden. And this was, uh, this was the new Linden in the Shelton Hills. It's another view later where he made some additions to the building. And an aerial, aerial view of the estate. Um, it was reviewed in a national magazine uh, as a very stately home, um, great terrace, afterglow of sunset and the gentle June twilight are enjoyed to the full. And uh, that's true today. Uh, it's got great use and it's a great place to be. You'll notice over there on the left side, this is the music hall that he built. He was, of course, very interested in music. He was a musician himself, uh, had learned to play the organ. And uh, we're gonna talk about this more in a moment. Uh, this was the greenhouse on his estate. Every one of the wealthy industrialists that live in Shelton Hills had to have their own greenhouse. They had to have their own art collection. Um, and uh, this was uh, Cyrus's greenhouse, where he grew all his flowers. Well, Cyrus and Louisa had a daughter, their only child, named um, Mary Louise Curtis. Uh, she helped her mother a little bit as she was um, growing up in her late teen years uh, down at the um, Ladies' Home Journal. When Bach came in, 
um, and took over. Uh, she assisted him. She, she's an interesting character. She, she was not apparently highly regarded. She was not interested in society in an age where every uh, wealthy businessman had a debutante party for their daughter. She, she would have none of that. She had no debutante party. It was said that she had no friends and um, several uh, biographers uh, referred to her as homely and shy. Well, she ended up marrying uh, in 1896, the age of 20, uh, Edward Bach. Uh, it was uh, at Linden, it was a strange wedding. There were only 12 people in attendance uh, and she had no bridesmaid, nobody, no maid of honor. And uh, they had a very quiet wedding. Uh, a loose, a news, local newspaper made this comment uh, that uh, about the wedding, they were thrown together. They were thrown much together, which is kind of curious and you can make what you want out of that wording. But uh, lest you have any salacious thoughts, let me point out that their first child was born on September 7th, 1897, which was 11 months after their marriage. Uh, a very uh, talented young, uh, young man uh, born at Linden, uh, William Curtis Bach became, inherited his parents' interest in music, became the president of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Um, the thing that I most admire about him being a frustrated sailor is that he had a 46 foot sailboat that he sailed not once, but twice across the Atlantic Ocean to England and back. Uh, he and his wife had a very talented son, Derek Curtis Bach, who was the 25th president of Harvard University. So there's a great strain of genes going through that family. Well, Mary Louise and Edward lived with their parents for uh, almost nine years as they decided uh, where they were going to live, and, and uh, they built, decided to build a house for themselves in the up-and-coming suburb of uh, Marion Station on the famed Philadelphia Main Line. Uh, by this time, the, the Pennsylvania Railroad's Main Line had superseded Shelton Hills as the uh, place for country estates for the wealthy of Philadelphia. Uh, they had a friend, poet Rudyard Kipling, who suggested the name swastika, <coughs> excuse me, for the estate, a uh, Hindu symbol of good luck. They liked the idea, and uh, that's what they named their estate. And of course, uh, with the turmoil in Europe in the 1930s, uh, by, by the end of the 1930s, they had removed that name and any, any record or any uh, remnant of that name from the estate. You know how you know that somebody is important? When, when they get a phone number that's number one, and this was Cyrus Curtis. This is the first telephone book in uh, suburban Philadelphia. And here's Cyrus Curtis. There's an easy number to remember. What's your telephone number? One. Very easy. Success continued for Cyrus Curtis. 1897, he purchased an, a magazine called the uh, Saturday Evening Post. Uh, hired a editor for that, George Horace Larimer. Um, Lorimer is another interesting character. He had, he had been a, um, a meat packer in Chicago for Armor Company and must have been a smart guy because he decided that he didn't like meat packing anymore after 10 years. Decided he wanted to be a journalist and went to Portland, Maine again, and took a job as a non-paid reporter for a newspaper there just to get his foot in the door. And in uh, early uh, 1890, uh, 99, he saw the advertisement by Curtis for an editor, and he, he went down to Philadelphia and kind of showed up on his doorstep and, and said, hey, why don't you interview me for this job? You know, he was just a young guy with no experience, and he must have been an awfully persuasive guy because Curtis gave him a job as an office boy right away. Soon after Lorimer started as an office boy, uh, Curtis had to go to Europe for a uh, for a meeting, and he left instructions with Lorimer. He said, listen, he said, I want you to go <clears throat> on such, such a date and pick up all the articles from all the, the publishers, the final version of the articles, and take them to the printer, and uh, they'll know what to do with it, and 
we have a layout already worked out and uh, so that this the post gets out on time which he did cyrus Gahertis came back from europe and uh, took a look at the issue of the saturday evening post and the layout was considerably different than he had left it in larmer's hands and he called in larmer and said hey what happened to this and uh Larmer told him, he said, well, I, I looked it over after I got everything together and I, I thought I could make some changes to improve it. <laughs> really cheeky. Uh, supposedly, Curtis looked at him and said, how much am I paying you? And uh, Larmer said, uh, you're paying me $50 a month, sir. And um, Curtis thought about it and said, all right, from now on, I'm paying you $500 a month. And a month later, he was appointed the editor of the Saturday Evening Post. So he must have been uh, quite a persuasive guy, quite a genius as evidenced by the success of the Saturday Evening Post, which became the second publication in the history of the United States to, uh, to uh, make a million subscribers. And of course, Larmer went on to discover all kinds of important people like uh, Norman Rockwell, the artist that, that did most of his covers and so on. Well, um, First decade of the 20th century went well for Curtis and Curtis Publishing and the family. 1910 ended up being an eventful year that would uh, uh, shake up the family and, and mark even further accomplishments for the Curtis empire. Louisa Knapp Curtis died uh, February 26, uh, 25th actually, 1910. Uh, it's easy to remember what the Curtises died of because they all died of heart disease and heart attacks. And she died of a, a heart attack. I, being, I, if I could be a uh, amateur psychologist for a minute, I kind of got the impression reading biographies and descriptions of her and the relationship that the relationship between her and Cyrus was really based on their, their, their business ambitions. Uh, she was a good businessman herself good businesswoman. She was working as a typist at, a, at a, um, a newspaper when they met. So she was um, uh, very uh, ambitious, uh, very accomplished. Um, and I, I wonder just uh, how much the relationship was a business relationship. Uh, she died, uh, had a very quiet wedding in, at Linden. And within six months, Doggone, Cyrus Curtis remarried. Of course, that had to be somebody else with a long name. He married a childhood sweetheart from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Kate Stanwood Cutter Pillsbury Curtis, and called her the, the love of his life, the love of his, of his youth. December of 1910, the empire continued to flourish. He built this spectacular new building across from Independence Hall in Philadelphia, the Curtis Building, now called the Curtis, the Curtis Center. Uh, it's one of the three monuments to Cyrus Curtis. There is no uh, celebratory monument for Cyrus Curtis in, in the Philadelphia, interestingly enough, but there are three surviving important um, uh, places that, that uh, are a credit to his career. Uh, Curtis Arboretum, as uh, we mentioned. And this is the second, his Curtis building, Curtis Center downtown. Uh, this is an important feature of the building. He hired uh, Louis Tiffany to build this fabulous uh, glass mosaic in the Curtis building, uh, which was completed and installed in 1914, based on a painting by Maxfield Parrish. And it's uh, quite a tourist attraction in Philadelphia. It's, it's extraordinarily beautiful. By that time, he um, kind of gave up the company. Edward Bach ran it for him. He was very happy with his relationship with uh, Kate. And they embarked on just an a, a extensive social life, organ recitals, luncheons, trips on his yacht to Lindonia. And um, this pretty much became his life after 1910. And here is the only film, the only movie I could find of Cyrus Curtis. And it, it's really, it's brief, but it's very enchanting. It was done in 1928. And um, it just looks like a happy environment. I, uh, Kate's, Kate is in this uh, 
film. And um, these children are Kate's grandchildren, not Cyrus's. And I, I'm really touched. You'll see as we go on, notice the relationship between the children and Kate. Uh, she just seems like such a perfect grandmother. Now, this is a silent film, but to uh, help improve it, I, I just added some uh, audio, some music to kind of illustrate the film. Well, this is the third monument to Cyrus Curtis. In 1924, Mary Louise uh, founded this Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. Uh, she purchased banker Anthony J. Drexel's mansion on uh, Rittenhouse Square, uh, purchased two other mansions uh, east of um, the Drexel mansion, and uh, that became the permanent home of the Curtis Institute. She not only purchased the homes, but she endowed the Curtis Institute with $12 million uh, of her, her own funds, uh, thus providing free tuition for anybody who was accepted uh, to the Curtis Institute for study, which is a practice that continues to this day. It's an extraordinary contribution to the culture of the city and the country. Well, 1930 dawned, the first three years of 1930, Mark the end of an era. Uh, on January 19th of uh, 1930, Edward Bach died. He was not feeling well. Winter was coming to Philadelphia. They decided to go down to their Florida estate in uh, Lake Wales uh, in Florida. And he died down there of, um, of a heart attack. 1932. Cyrus and Kate decided to go up to uh, Camden, Maine, to their estate up there for a little vacation early in the summer. They were traveling on the Lindonia and were just approaching uh, Long Island when Cyrus suffered a stroke. The captain turned the Lindonia around. They immediately came back to Philadelphia. And about the 27th or 28th, he was moved into Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. Kate was given the room next to him by the hospital to live in in order to care for him. And uh, on May 31st, just three days after they moved in, uh, the nurse went into Kate's room and found her uh, deceased uh, in her bed. She died in her sleep of a heart attack in the room next to uh, Cyrus. Uh, she was taken back to Linden for a simple funeral on June 3rd. Cyrus, of course, could not attend because he was in bad condition. He was in what we today we would probably call intensive care in Jefferson Hospital. Cyrus lingered for a year, did manage another cruise on the Lindonia down to Florida and back. And on June 7th, uh, after returning to Linden, he died there. A very, uh, um, classy funeral was arranged for him by his daughter, Mary Louise, uh, consisted of scriptures, um, scriptural readings, poems, prayers, organ uh, music, 
600 people came to the funeral. It's hard, it's kind of hard to imagine. The uh, it was held in the music hall, and the um, music hall at best can hold 150 people seated. So I think what probably happened was the uh, the Curtis Music Hall had large three uh, large Palladian windows on either side of um, the hall that were really doors. They probably opened the doors, I suspect, and people sat outside as well. The um, the Curtis directed that uh, at his funeral that the organ would play uh, the um, his favorite song, um, Kochmar's hymn called The Song in the Night. The um, organ at Curtis Hall was played by Will McFarlane, who was the municipal organist of the Portland uh, Municipal Hall, which by that time had an organ that uh, Cyrus had contributed to, uh, to Portland, Maine. And he had by that time contributed uh, six other organs to uh, various places in Philadelphia and to two churches in Portland. And uh, McFarlane and uh, Mary Louise arranged to have all seven organs at three o'clock during the service play the Kochmar hymn, accompanied by the 40 Voice Portland Men's Singing Club. Now I'm appreciative, I, uh, thanks to uh, Friends of Kochmar Organ, we, we got the sheet music. There I, uh, doesn't appear to be any recordings of the Kochmar hymn. But I have added music to this little interlude, and the music is uh, the music that Curtis directed be played as his processional for his funeral. Uh, Frederick Handel's Xerxes Largo, and that was played, and it's easy to imagine uh, Curtis being brought up the aisle to the front of the music hall while all seven organs uh, in the Eastern United States played Kochmer's hymn. Curtis was buried in uh, one of the large uh, public cemeteries in Philadelphia, West Laurel Hill on the west side of the Schuylkill River. And it's kind of ironic because his two wives were buried in the main cemetery, Laurel Hill on the east side. So I'm not sure what was going on there. Well, Mary Louise was widowed. She was living in this large estate in, in uh, Marion Station on the main line was not interested in Linden and approached her friend, the uh, chairman of the Board of Commissioners of Cheltenham Township, Ralph Morgan, who was a very smart and dedicated man with the idea of donating uh, at least 10 acres with the mansion to Cheltenham Township as a, as a public park. Uh, she did specify that she would uh, demolish the mansion, regrettably. And uh, the, the prevailing wisdom that survived the years here in Cheltenham is that she, she did it to avoid paying taxes, which even then were very high in Cheltenham. I, I always found that explanation suspect. And after all, she was a multimillionaire. She had inherited $18 million from Cyrus uh, when he died. So I'm not sure what was going on there either, but she tore down the building, kept the music hall, and turned over, as it turned out, 46 acres to uh, Cheltenham Township and subdivided the rest for, for housing. The, uh, she, she didn't want anything in the building. Uh, typical kid, they don't want anything their parents have. Uh, sent them to auction and um, it's amazing what's there. The Queen Anne mantles, French Louis XVI mantelpieces, my goodness. 
bronzes, etchings, walnut, mahogany, furniture, Limoges, and enamels. She did hire the son of Frederick Law Olmsted, the, uh, ar the landscape architect for Central Park, who was carrying on the company after Frederick died, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., to turn the grounds into an arboretum. And he planted about uh, five or 600 trees uh, to beautify the grounds, which we enjoy today. And on February 11th, 1938, Curtis Hall was dedicated as a public park um, in Cheltenham Township with over 300 people uh, in attendance, including both our senators, our congressmen, and representatives of Cur Curtis, um, and so on. Mary Louise wed again. And she wed the director of the Curtis Institute, Ephraim Zimbalist, who was brought there in uh, 1938 as a, to teach violin and, and uh, succeeded to the position of director of, um, of the Curtis Institute. Kind of turned the tables while she was 13 years younger than uh, Edward Bach when they got married. She now was 13 years older than Ephraim. So this was the second marriage for Mar uh, Mary Louise. It was also the second marriage for Ephraim Zimbalist. Ephraim had been married to an opera singer by the name of Alma Gluck. And uh, forgive me for, for taking it lightly, but this was the second marriage for Alma. She was married to an insurance salesman by the name of Bernie Glick. So technically she was Alma Gluck Glick uh, when she married Ephraim Zimbalist, becoming Alma Gluck Glick Zimbalist. But she still today holds the record, and this is the answer to the trivia question. Uh, she was a, apparently a very accomplished uh, opera singer and uh, holds the record today as the most recorded musical uh, artist in the history of the United States. They had a son, and I'll bet you there's people there that recognize Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., the actor who just died a couple years ago. Mary Louise Curtis Box Zimbalist died in 1970 on January 4th, and um, it's actually buried in Connecticut, and I'm not sure what the connection is there. Ephraim Zimbalist himself uh, survived for another 15 years, moved to Reno, Nevada, where his daughter Mary lived and uh, died, in, uh, died in Reno, Nevada at the age of 95. Well, I'm gonna finish with just a very brief tour of our beautiful Curtis Arboretum here in Shelton Hills, now called Wincote. And uh, it's, a, it's a very popular park, very well used and a very, very beautiful place. And that's the story of Curtis Arboretum. Tom, thank you so much. That was so much more than the story of Curtis Arboretum. I am I am thrilled at the depth at which you went into. That was that was wonderful. Thank you.
Um, at this time, I would like to open it up to the audience. If there's anyone who has a question for um, our presenter this evening, for Tom, um, please go ahead and use the chat box feature. If you signed on a little late, you can access that by clicking um, down on the bottom toolbar of your screen. There's a little icon that says chat, and you can type your question right in there. I'll make sure it gets it. Uh, we did have a comment that came in, a comment question that came in um, from Vicki while you were uh, speaking much earlier in the program. Uh, she asked, was the boat, the Lindonia, that used to be docked at the Camden Yacht Club, which was Curtis's boathouse. So do you know much about the Lindonia and what its eventual uh, fate was? Yeah, I, uh, all I know from it is uh, you apparently had a lecture last year from somebody who uh, was involved with the Lindonia. And I was in contact with him and learned a lot about it. Yeah, it was, um, make a long story short, it ended up serving in World War II in the Pacific. Uh, as a uh, headquarters of um, of the officer corps in uh, in the Pacific campaign, just to make a very long story short, but uh, that that's what happened to it eventually. And I think I think uh, it hit a coral reef and sunk or something like that, and was lost. Again, if there's anyone who's on this uh, program or on this call who, who might have a little more information about that and wants to type it into the chat box so that we can all enjoy that information, feel free to do that. I know that we have a number of people here um, attending who have worked with the family or who are descendants of the family, so they might have some good, some good knowledge. Um, we have a question that came in. It says, uh, where was the Curtis home in Camden and is it still standing? Yeah, that... Um uh, that slide I showed you in, in Camden, that little row house, uh, that was his home, his first home. It was uh, on Penn Street above Second. And um, oh, I may have that backwards, Second Street above Penn. Remarkably, it's still standing because Camden has gone through all kinds of uh, throes of redevelopment. His second house on Cooper Street was demolished. It does not exist anymore. So that was the answer to the question about where his house in Camden, New Jersey was. Do you happen to know much about his house or their home in um, Camden, Maine? No, I do not. I'm okay. Sorry. <laughs> I, know, I know it's called Lindenwood. So, so if anyone uh, has a little more information about that home, again, feel free to type it into the chat box. Um, I, assumed, I assumed everybody knew about that. <laughs> I wouldn't research that if, uh, if I knew there was interest. Oh, I've only been living here for um, almost two years, so I'm still learning so much. And actually, you know, this is a good opportunity to plug the, the Walsh History Center at the Camden Public Library. Ken Gross um, can answer all of these questions. He's a, he's a treasure trove of, of information. Um, okay, so Maggie says, have you been to any weddings at the, Kerber, at the Curtis Arboretum? I got engaged overlooking Curtis Island, and I'm getting married at the Arboretum next fall. I was looking for Maggie's picture here. <laughs> uh, funny you should ask that, Maggie. <laughs> because my oldest daughter was married at Immaculate Conception Church in nearby Jenkintown, and we had the wedding reception there at Curtis Arboretum, and it was just fantastically lovely. It was beautiful. The um, Right now, we, the township has signed a, a contract uh, last year with a, uh, a, uh, an events specialist who operates it as a wedding venue. And uh, we were very fortunate because he was contracted to uh, putting my Cheltenham Township Historical Commission hat on. He was, he was contracted to uh, spend uh, $500,000 on, on the renovations of Curtis Hall and the grounds and everything. And, and he was so happy to be there, despite the fact he has three other wedding venues, that he ended up spending three quarters of a million dollars on the renovations. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we have him uh, to thank for the beauty of, um, the continuing beauty of that grounds in the hall. Yeah, so my, my daughter had a reception there and, and uh, until the coronavirus hit, place was packed with weddings almost every weekend. Yes, when I, I googled it and, and weddings came up, lots of wedding <laughs> information. Yeah. Um, we have a, a comment says, there are box here in Camden now, are they relatives of the box that you mentioned? I think they are because Edward and um, Mary Louise also had a summer home uh, there in Camden. 
and uh, I forget the name of it. It was something like Rag Rag uh, Ragahan or something like that. Ah, can't remember. But so they were also visitors for over thirty years uh, to Camden. So I don't know, but um, I I won't be surprised. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, and of course you know uh, Derek was uh, a resident of Boston and um, uh, the, the president of Harvard, the grandson. Uh, so I won't be surprised if he didn't have, didn't inherit and didn't have a place up there. Mm, it looks like we have some answers to some previous questions that we were posing. Uh, I have a comment in here that says, Lindenwood is by Calderwood Lane near the Children's Chapel. So if you're familiar with kind of the Camden Rockport uh, transition there, you'll, you'll know where that is. Um, yes, another person says, Lindenwood is the first house on the left after the golf course on Calderwood Lane. Wow. So I will have to make sure I'm paying attention to that next time I go by there. Yeah. Um, Anne yeah. says that Jeffrey Miller is the caterer. I'm guessing she's yeah. referring to uh, the, the Curtis Hall. Um, Jane says, I grew up in Ambler and Orland but oh. live in Camden half the year. I volunteer at the history department at the library and last year cataloged all of the Mary Louise Curtis Fox Zimbalist papers and photos for the library. Yes, she did. Oh, She's, you, which library, your library? Or, yeah, yes, our library has an extensive collection of Mary Louise Curtis Fox Zimbalist. Yeah, who did you get them from? Um, Jane, can you go ahead and type in? She wants to I know. Think I know and I, I've been trying to track them down. Well, I can always connect the two of you later. I'm, I'm good uh, friends. I, I would appreciate that because we were in touch with uh, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr.'s secretary who promised us his papers. And we never heard from her again. And despite, <laughs> despite multiple phone calls, I wonder if that's the collection that uh, we were re she was referring to. Well, I will connect you with Jane afterwards, definitely. Um, and Jane is asking if Gordon Bach is on this call. I think he might be. Uh, Quite perhaps I saw Gordon earlier. Um, all right, well, oh, here we go. Nice presentation, thank you very much. All right, well, I think that was the last question that came in. Um, and again, I, I wanna let folks know if you guys enjoy this and you wanna share this information, and again, if you are a Camden resident or a Philadelphia res resident, there was so much to get out of this to um, get a deeper understanding of, of our communities, um, both of our communities, um, famous family. Uh, please feel free to share this talk. It's going to be on, on the uh, YouTube channel for the Camden Public Library starting tomorrow. Um, Tom, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun and very interesting. And, thank you, Julia. And we'll, we'll, we'll try to get you back after your next book comes out. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful evening, Enjoy everyone. Oh, up there. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.